Hey, what's up? Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Simply Pod Logical, a Simply Neological podcast. Hello. Today's episode is brought to you by Holo Taco. Holo Taco. Holo Taco is having a one coat Black Friday sale, a pre Black Friday it's sale. Pre Black Friday. Tell us all about week. it, Christine. So you get a free one coat black. You know the one, the best, the only one coat black nail polish <laughs> is the best black nail polish you'll ever use. Mm. I may be biased, but I made it, so that's why it's good. Um, with any purchase of a collection set, which is our Frosted Metals collection set, or any bundle, which we have on our website under bundles and sets. There's a tab for that. So I think it's a great deal if you were looking to get the Frosted Metals set yep. for a friend's, uh, you know, Christmas, Hanukkah, the holidays. I think it's a great gift and you get a free Wonko Black for yourself or give it to your friend. It's up to you. So we have that going on all week until Black Friday, at which point on actual Black Friday day on Friday... <laughs> that's that's how that works yeah. uh the promotion will change so it won't be that anymore it'll be something else but what i can tell you is the frosted metals collection set isn't going to be discounted so if you want that set this is i think your best bet cool so you could check that out at www.holotaco.com register trademark <laughs> okay yeah okay that's what we're going to talk about today so christine just posted a simply neological video about all the times uh companies have stolen pictures and video of your nails to promote their uh, shitty products online, rude. right? so rude. And it's a lot of like, I think you put it fast fashion. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of garbage sort of like companies. Temporary yeah. online stores that have weird names and probably are stealing your credit card information if you ever bought yeah. from them. Uh, but just while you were making that video, it made us sort of reminisce about sort of our experience in the last four, five, six years of some issues we've had with trademark infringement or other mm -hmm. companies sort of stealing your intellectual property. And we thought that might be an interesting conversation to have on the podcast because when we briefly talked about trademarks before, people actually seemed pretty yeah. interested you in the topic. You guys want to know about the law? <laughs> and it's an aspect of YouTube that I guess doesn't really get talked about a lot. Like I think people are familiar with like copyright because copyright often, strike. Yeah, YouTubers yeah. are getting copyright strikes usually for using other people's content or music, music. in their videos, right? But yeah, this is an aspect of being a YouTuber where if you're a big successful YouTuber with a big online audience, other companies are totally looking for ways to profit off of your goodwill and your reputation and some of your ideas. That 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 definitely and happens. And they want to do that by using your audience. Like they ultimately want to take your audience and sell them things using mm -hmm. the influencers, you know, catchphrases. So it's not just about um, taking advantage of influencers, it's taking advantage of everyone who looks up to them and, you know, wants to buy a t-shirt that has their name on it. That's a good point, because it's, it's easy to think of when celebrities like try to claim ownership of words, I think it's easy to kind of roll your eyes mm -hmm. and uh, think they're just being entitled and kind of unreasonable. But at the end of the day, I think the biggest risk... I think a lot of the times the people trying to do that are trying to protect their audience from being taken advantage of by other companies, at least to some from degree. From being duped, yeah. Yeah, that's an aspect of it for sure. If we go back all the way to, you know, 2016, 2017, and we were trying to think of like when we started taking uh, intellectual property law seriously and we started talking to an IP lawyer, uh, I think it kind of goes back to when when you first released Hollow It's Me and Hollow Sexual merch. Mm -hmm. So like t-shirts with like the holographic foil on them. Uh, we very quickly noticed that uh, counterfeit versions of that merch were showing up online, right? Mm -hmm. And this is exper an experience a lot of YouTubers have. Just maybe a quick shout out to uh, the tube filter guys have recently started a YouTube <laughs> yeah. channel and they put out a video about uh, YouTuber merch being stolen and how it's still a problem and how it has really big uh, financial implications. Mm -hmm. They talked to Eddie Burback in that video. I'm not sure if you know Eddie, but uh, he, he released Yikes merch. Uh, this is a few months ago and he had teased the day before that it was about to come out. And in between him teasing it and launching it the next day, dozens of shitty websites popped up selling his exact design of that merch right to the point uh to the point of when he launched the next day 
his our, main yeah, official yeah. storefront was on like the second page of Google results, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's a frustration that like you're losing sales from your fan base. There is that just sort of selfish business aspect of it, but it's also like you don't want your fan base getting ripped off by these shitty companies that are stealing other artists' artwork and your property, and mm -hmm. you don't know they're just not going to get a good product from it either, yeah, right? you have no idea the quality. You can't control it, and it may reflect poorly on the YouTuber. If your fan gets a backpack they're disappointed in, and mm -hmm. you're like, well, I didn't make it, <laughs> but someone took my name or my, you know, related content and slapped it on. Totally. So, yeah, there, there's definitely millions of dollars being lost to mm -hmm. these, or being made by these sort of counterfeit bootleggers, right? So, and that's our, on merch specifically. Yeah, we're specifically yeah, we're talking, talking about merch. merch. So uh, our experience was what? We noticed uh, like 100 listings on Amazon. So this is our, our first experience with trademark with any sort of trip. I yeah. mean, this is copyright too because they took the literal right. design. We're mostly going to be talking about trademark, but copyright as well. Do you think we should kind of explain to our best understanding the difference? Uh, I think I'd rather just say we are not lawyers. We're not lawyers. Don't, please yeah. don't take any of this as legal mm -hmm. advice. We're just telling you our sort of limited individual experience. We're, with these yeah, issues. so we're not trademark or copyright or IP lawyers, but we are business owners and we've had to talk to our own IP lawyers that we've mm -hmm. had for five years now to try and understand this, to try and understand what we can do to protect ourselves. And we've paid, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees to do all that. Yeah. So it it isn't our job to understand the law, but it is our job, I think, as a responsible business owners and brand owners to pay people <laughs> to, <laughs> to you know, understand who, who understand you. and yeah. who have the education and the background and the knowledge to do so. So totally. it's mostly Ben, fun fact, who deals with the lawyers. Like you're the one on the phone talking to the IP lawyer most of the time. Sure. It's, not, it's not me. <laughs> and I get, uh, especially early on, I think I got a little too involved. Like I would... Uh... <laughs> Well, we'll get into it, but like I was basically like building yeah. lawsuits in my head <laughs> and the lawyers just thought I was nuts, right? So we're not going to proclaim to, you know, we're not going to define trademark and all the ins and outs of it because we're not lawyers, um, but just very high level. I think it's safe to say that just so people understand generally the difference from my understanding is trademark is usually an expensive process whereby you register a term, a saying, a name or a picture or a, a design, a symbol, a a symbol yeah. um, through a formal process for a particular country. Mm -hmm. And it can cost thousands of dollars to register for, to file a trademark. It eventually gets registered mm -hmm. if it's approved, but that can take years and thousands of dollars. Yeah, Copyright is a little bit different, although I know in Canada there is somewhat of a registration process. It's mm -hmm. less um, expensive, and I don't even think you need lawyers to do it. You, Some people might defer to one, um, mm -hmm. but I think copyright is more based on just the principle of your ownership of that piece of work or art. Like, if mm -hmm. you can easily prove that, let's say, for example, I made this video, I posted this Chrome video on my Simply an Illogical channel. I don't need to register my video with an official office mm -hmm. to show or claim that I own it because it is clearly something that was produced by me and put on a social media that says my name. Mm -hmm. So I would say that I think lawyers would say, well, like, that is your copyright. It, that's not a trademark mm -hmm. because a trademark requires a more specific tangible uh like saying or line or visual that you've intentionally uh, like registered with the trademark office right is that like I, very I, high level <laughs> yeah i think that's fair and you make a good point you know like if you're a youtuber who publishes a video and like that like the fact that it exists on your official owned channel is good evidence of your ownership of that piece of your copy, content copyright and you yeah. own the rights to it right so yeah. like yeah, you don't need to show some sort of registration. But if you're trying to argue that you own a logo or like a very specifically drawn piece of artwork or just uh, a word or a unique name of something that you have claimed rights to to describe a certain category of products, that's where trademark law is much more important. Correct. Yeah. Especially for brands. I think when people think trademark, they think more brands. <laughs> and that's because brands usually are investing in their brand, which also 
includes paying for lawyers, you know, to make sure that you're protected and so that no other companies can use the same name as your brand to sell things. Yeah. I think once we sort of do a crash course in like our sort of experiences with these things, it might be nice to sort of loop back around to the end and ask like, would we actually recommend is that a YouTuber yeah. go through the process of registering all these trademarks and things like that? Because mm -hmm. you're right, we've spent, it's different because you have a nail polish line, but we've spent over $100,000 registering trademarks Oh, it's over more the years. than that. Yeah. I know because I see all the invoices <laughs> and then I pay them. So <laughs> yeah, it's been very expensive, but okay. uh, let's go back, rewind yeah, let's to, rewind to 2016. When we, we didn't know anything about this. So all of a sudden on Amazon, we're seeing all these knockoffs of your Hollow It's Me merch mostly. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the that it's the same word. It's that it's like they literally just pulled the exact same artwork. They clearly ripped off both what we are arguing is your mm -hmm. trademark phrase, but also the artwork of the T-shirt itself. And I was selling T-shirts and hoodies, I think, at that time yeah. that said hollow, it's me, and hollow sexual mm -hmm. with the little stars. And they basically just replicated the exact same thing. And we even met people in real life at things like VidCon who had clearly... Uh, bought mistakenly the bought the knockoff you know stuff and how it looked I knew? terrible. You know how I knew it was the knockoff? It was fake hollow, right? it was right? fake hollow. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't it? They just, they had a picture of hollow, but like they would just print it on the shirt instead of using the yeah. foil that's actually expensive and Disgusting. looks holographic, right? See, lies. It's all lies. So I remember at first we tried going through a process with Amazon to get them taken down, right? And we mm -hmm. did a bunch of homework and detective work and we figured out it was some almost all the listings traced back to this one individual vendor who uh, we tracked down based off, they had registered a website through another platform that was in Vietnam. And uh, we kind of realized very quickly without even talking to a lawyer at this point that there's not a whole lot you can do about that, frankly. Mm -hmm. Policing your trademarks and your works getting ripped off by some bootlegger somewhere in Asia, like good luck. The The much more viable path to addressing this for us was to get Amazon's attention mm -hmm. as, you know, a legitimate business that doesn't want to be hosting a bunch of counterfeit products on their store. And when we tried to reaching out to them individu individually, we weren't very successful. I didn't get a response. We, I don't yeah. think we even got a response or it wasn't very clear, but we, we then... Uh, got an IP lawyer who specifically deals with these matters. And when he drafted a letter with a fancy letterhead and everything and sent it to them, that's when we got a response from Amazon. Yes. So, but it wasn't just the lawyer. I think it was also the fact that we'd already filed uh, to trademark, right? Some of the sayings. So holosexual and hollow, it's me. Yeah. I believe at that time, I think we'd already initiated the filings. So I don't know this for a fact, but I assume that Amazon's offices, when they got the letter from our lawyer and our lawyer was pointing to that filing mm -hmm. in the US, which is, it was amazon.com hosting these, they were like, okay, you're pointing to some real legal things that we have to agree and we are going to remove the listings. That's what I suspect made them take it down. Yeah. And but. on some of these other websites where you can just, without a lawyer, make a claim to have things taken down they'll maybe ask you to show something proving your ownership of that design or that mark. And if you have a registration, that is the easy answer to very clearly demonstrate that you own the rights to that thing and they should take it down. And most reputable websites should have a, a claims mm -hmm. process by which they would take it they down. Usually, so I've done that on Facebook a long time ago. There was someone yeah. selling some Hollow It's Me something. Okay. And since we had filed registration I could point to, I just myself, not my lawyer, did the, the claims process, mm -hmm. attached the link for the, the trademark filing, and then they took it down. Yeah, so I think these early days, you're right. We, we already had started registering to get like mm -hmm. Hollow It's Me, Hollow Sexual, I think Hollow Queen was another early one. And Simply Nailogical, and, and obviously. And your, the trade name itself, yeah. And uh, I think the thinking there is we were already playing around with some design ideas for merch. Mm -hmm. And there was maybe like the, the hint of an idea that there could be a nail polish line or a nail polish collab in the future where you would want to very clearly claim your ownership of the terms that you had invented specifically in relation to nail polish. Or the terms that I was just using so often that mm -hmm. were so associated with my brand. Yeah. Like, fun fact, we started the trademark for Hollow Taco in 2016. 
long yeah. before I knew I was going to have a nail polish brand named Hollow yeah. Taco. So we were lucky, I guess, in doing all of that trademark kind of pre-work because it takes years for it to go through and be approved and be opposed and be approved and all these things, right? Mm -hmm. So we were lucky that like most of that process was done by the time we actually launched Hollow Taco. Yeah. So I guess the Amazon example is just like the first sort of wake up call that this really mattered. Until that yeah. point, we had just sort of done it because it kind of seemed like a good idea to do. We were kind of future proofing. We're pretty uh, conservative people, as in we are pretty, we want to be safe and protect you. And we had other friends in the industry who had gone through issues with people. So I think mm -hmm. we just sort of knew to do this to some degree. I think, yes, with what happened with Amazon, the fact that we could point to the registration, had we not had that registration, we would have not had a good case, even though I know like all my fans and everyone would argue, well, it's so clearly you're saying you say hollow, it's me in every video. It's all over your merch. It's in your bio. You Google that you're the first thing that comes up. How could someone possibly, mm -hmm. how could Amazon disagree? Well, Amazon isn't a court and they're not in the business of deciding, yeah, you deserve that saying. Um, and they're not just going to take down listings on their website because of that. They only did it, I, I think, is because we were able to point to a legal registered filing. <laughs> and I think that moment, even though I hated how incredibly expensive it was just <laughs> at that point, and that was years ago to get to that point, it made us realize that, you know what, I do think that it is important to invest in this um, for other future marks that we think we want to protect just because we don't want companies to abuse them, to use my likeness, basically, and to use you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, really good. And the good point you made in there, too, is that uh, technically you don't really need a trademark to make a legal argument that someone is yeah. using your intellectual property, right? Right but it just makes it so much easier to make the case to people to be able to appeal yeah. to something formal like that. To it's do just it, like right? very clear evidence that's indisputable. Yeah. But if we didn't have that, like maybe they would decide in our favor, but mm -hmm. I don't know. So it's hard to say whether it's worth it. Maybe we'll, we'll come back to that at the end. <laughs> yeah. uh, but we were very proactive. I would say on average, we were more proactive than the average YouTuber mm -hmm. that very early in my YouTube career, we were spending thousands of dollars already on trademarking mm -hmm. stuff. We were also proactive just in registering as a business. This is a tangent and I'll, I'll just do this really briefly, but you hear about some YouTubers who get successful very quickly, maybe at a young age, and you really need someone there to appeal to, to like how to structure your business in a way mm -hmm. where you're not just gonna make all of that online income personally, personal income. as if it's just your personal income for a year, right? Yeah. Anyway, well, that's, that's a conversation a for another but time. But we were a lot, we were very old compared oh, to the average person ancient. who, you know, becomes <laughs> famous online. We were older. So we yeah. had that kind of on our side. Okay. So this was our first taste of uh, someone else stealing your designs or your IP. And I was very upset. And it was early on. So we had those hollow, it's me, holosexual, a few of the applications ongoing. Uh, I think the sort of next like landmark thing that sticks out in my mind is... Uh, while we were trying to register the holosexual trademark, I know we've talked about that term before and how we basically uh, don't really embrace it as much today. Mm -hmm. It's not something you've talked about this uh, yeah. elsewhere. I'm not going to rehash that. But at the time, we thought it was important and pretty fundamental to... It's what I called my subscribers and what mm -hmm. the community... What they called themselves. Yeah, sorry. And yeah. kind of what the community used to describe themselves. So and it was it... very much associated with Simply Neological. Yeah, incredibly. But... What we found is when we were trying to apply for the holosexual trademark. So part of the, the trademark process is like, so you identify what you're trying to register as a trademark, whether it's a word, a certain illustration of that word, or just a graphic, a, a symbol, a logo. Uh, you say, uh, this varies based on jurisdiction. Canada and the U.S. is a little different. But basically you say what goods or services you are claiming that mark mm -hmm. for. And then to some degree, uh, this varies by jurisdictions again, but you're trying, you say uh, when your use of it started first or use. whether, yeah, what yeah. the date of first use of, or if it's just intended use, things like that. Right. So we'd put the holosexual application together and it gets sent off to an examiner. Job of the examiner is to look at your application and <laughs> If your lawyer's done a good job, like you might not hear a lot back, but I feel like you always hear something just so that they justify their job, basically. <laughs> 
but they'll make some corrections to what you say. So, for example, we uh, in Hollow Queen, we got a note back saying, we want you to add a disclaimer in here that you're not also claiming the exclusive rights to using the words, the, the, the abbreviation of hollow in and of itself, right? Mm -hmm. you, we'll give you hollow queen or we'll let your application proceed for hollow queen, but you're not allowed to say you own the word hollow when it comes to nail polish. Mm -hmm. And could you, like, if we had actually made that argument, could you imagine the reaction from like the nail polish community? No, so <laughs> we agreed. And just to be clear, yeah. we do not and we have don't. never intended to, intended, intended to suggest that we own the word hollow. No. It's the combination of hollow and it's me, for yeah. example, or hollow and sexual and other things that were just mm -hmm. so um, closely tied to the Simply sure. Neological uh, brand and discourse. Yeah, people were using the term hollow before you came around. Right. And it's just descriptive of holographic. So it, you can't really make the you claim can't really for it anyway, that, yeah. I would say. So that's like an example of something you might hear back from right. an examiner. They're looking at other trademarks people have that might conflict with yours to try to avoid those sorts of things. Uh, what's another example of what we heard? Uh, like we, like maybe we listed that we wanted to register that trademark for a bunch of goods in a certain class and said like nail art accessories. They might come back and say, you can't just say accessories. You need to tell us what those mm -hmm. accessories are. So it's not open-ended and open to interpretation or intentionally vague. So those are the sorts of things you hear back. And But just before you go on, for classes of goods, I think this is important to point out. Even if you're registering a trademark, um, it doesn't just cover anything in the world for that that particular word, mm -hmm. right? So if we were registering holosexual, we had to identify, I think we ended up choosing five or six, something like that, classes of goods, mm -hmm. rather than the how many dozens actually exist out there. Like there's a category for computers. We're, we're not saying computers because it has nothing to do with mm -hmm. us and also you pay for every class of goods that you want to register for it so you need to be smart and think about what actually makes sense so yeah. we were applying for all of my trademarks we generally apply in ones that make sense for me so mm -hmm. it's probably related to nail art and beauty cosmetics uh, online apparel. video services apparel yeah. right so those are specific classes of goods that you pay for each class you're right and you're not claiming to own any of these terms in anything outside of the classes that you're applying for. Not from a trademark perspective. From a trademark perspective, Even yeah. though if someone clearly used something that's clearly yours on a product that doesn't fall into your classes, you could still make an argument that they're creating confusion in the marketplace, marketplace and right. things like that, but you wouldn't really specifically be able to point to a trademark for that exact product category, right? And also the whole point of trademarks and picking which classes of goods is because usually you intend to use your trademark on mm -hmm. a product in those classes, right? But in practice, a lot of people will apply for trademarks and uh, will like sort of cautiously include goods that they could hypothetically see themselves making in the future, Just even if they don't themselves. have firm yeah. plans to do so, right? So right. you'll see some forums and threads where like they're trying to guess what some person is going to release next and they'll be like look i found they have a trademark application that includes uh, magnets <laughs> or I, I don't know just some yeah random thing. actually i see that a lot in beauty so yeah. people will look at like beauty influencers and see what they've trademarked for the next year and say oh that means they're coming out with lipstick because mm -hmm. they've trademarked a, a lipstick um class or something but i don't think that's always what it means i think it also just could mean that they're just protecting that type of cosmetic so that no one can use their name or slogan on a lipstick because it would be very much closely associated with their brand. Yeah. At the same time, like people shouldn't do that just speculatively. Like right. you, you shouldn't be just registering for a bunch of goods. You have no plans on doing it. It's also really it's expensive. It's just a waste of money and it doesn't make sense. Yeah. And technically that's not how trademark law is supposed to work. Even if mm -hmm. people do, it's obvious that people do do that to some degree. Sorry, I, I uh, kicked you off track there. No, so. yeah, where were we? So yeah, so examiner, your examiner, yeah. he, at that point, uh, your trademark application will get published somewhere. And that gives an opportunity for other companies Opposition. to oppose your trademark application. Fancy. If the, even if the examiner said it's fine, maybe some other company thinks there's too much of a risk of confusion or your mark's too similar to theirs. And that happened to us on the holosexual mark. Mm -hmm. So what did, we, what did we hear back, Christine? I'm not sure how specific we want to get about this one because... It did sort of escalate a little bit, and then we just came to an understanding with them and let it go. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to open any old wounds. But uh, 
there's a perfume company that's pretty big in Canada. I think they're a Canadian company even actually called uh, yeah. Sexuel Perfume. With an accent. Sexuel with an accent. Yeah. And they own a trademark for the word sexual when it comes to perfume. And they also have it for just some classes of like apparel and just some yeah, pretty apparel, generic yeah. categories of merchandise. And it's a good example of someone getting like a very common word people use and and registering that trademark way back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And some people might just think that sounds crazy, but it's important to note it's not like they're using it in a descriptive way, right? So like Apple computers is the best example of this that I think people understand. Like, like an Apple is just a common thing. Like how can Apple computers own the word Apple? Well, so no, they only own it in relation to computers and an apple is not a word that describes computers right right so they're allowed so to own the word unique apple in that sense and apple would be mad and oppose someone else trying to release crab apple computers mm -hmm. because <laughs> there would be too much risk of confusion there right yeah uh so similarly this these people argue that we own the word uh, sexual for perfume uh it's not descriptive of perfume and holosexual is too close. There's a risk of confusion because sexual is literally inside the word holosexual. And they even argued that nail polish and perfume are, are a similar type of product that there could be a risk of confusion. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I remember we were just like baffled by this and pretty unhappy with it because we just thought like this company hadn't, how do I put this? When someone hears the word sexual, they don't think of this company and all the value that company and all the goodwill right. that brand has given to it's, that word. The word sexual isn't unique enough to make you think of this brand. Yeah, but if someone just says Apple, they might think of Apple computers right. before they literally even think of that piece of fruit, right? Maybe. So, so like, I, I get it for Apple, but like the sexual perfume line hasn't made the word sexual famous for any sort of category of products from our perspective. So I think we tried to argue that there wouldn't be confusion in the marketplace mm -hmm. because our audiences were entirely different, right? Theirs was yeah. a, a perfume who I think their customer base was probably older women, like 40 plus, mm -hmm. where in, in physical stores, whereas yeah. our audience was younger and a digital online audience. Mm -hmm. And I, we also just made the argument that the term holosexual in its entirety was this entirely unique term that you just sort of pulled out of thin air that was highly unique and associated with you. Whereas and, like yeah. the word sexual, like no one even really thinks about when it came yeah. to them. Anyway, I, let's not get into it too much, but essentially we challenged uh, their trademark and then we heard from their lawyer and we just sort of came to an understanding that we would make some changes in our trademark application if they dropped their opposition mm -hmm. to ours. So it's like a negotiation or a mm -hmm. mediation. No one went to court. No. That's not what this is. This is just lawyers, you know, going back and forth, discussing, okay, you do this, I'll do this. We agree to this. The goal isn't like we don't want to step on someone's toes and mm -hmm. we don't want other people to step on ours. Yeah, so. and, and the truthfully, like... This dragged out for months, I think. It's a very long process to register for trademarks, especially if issues like this come up. And I feel like by the time we were starting to have conversations about whether we wanted to pursue it and really challenge that we had the right to register that mark, I think you were already sorting, yeah. sort of starting Shifting to move away on. from it. So it just became less of a priority to really mm -hmm. uh, be so invested in challenging it. But isn't that kind of crazy, though? And I know people listening will still be a little confused how someone could trademark the word sexual and that prevent anyone else from using sexual with another word <laughs> yeah, or, or anything. Here's the thing. Like, was it preventing us from using it or were they just really... Did they Good really point. care about not letting other people register anything else similar at all? Yeah. Because that just might challenge their ability to really stake their ownership on being exclusively the people mm -hmm. that own that word under the law, right? I remember at the time we looked into, uh, we looked at some case law about like how to adjudicate whether or not two trademarks are, are too similar enough. I think it's a, like a, some case in federal court in the States and they have this thing, they're called the DuPont factors. So it's a list of 13, actually I have them if you want to know. 
What is it, Ben? So, Teach us. Yeah, here, here are the 13 mustache DuPont ben? factors. You look like a trademark lawyer with that <laughs> dirty mustache. What does that mean? <laughs> uh, so the similarity of each trademark in question, so that means the appearance, the connotation, commercial impression, or auditory resemblance. Hmm. So there definitely was some argument to like holosexual and sexual sound the same, appear the same there. One word is contained in the other. Uh, similarity or dissimilarity of the nature of the goods and services. Is nail polish too similar to perfume? Uh, three, the similarity of established trade channels that are likely to continue. We could make the argument that we are in completely different trade channels. They're selling to uh, old women who buy perfume at department stores, and we were selling to a younger crowd of people exclusively online. Mm -hmm. um, four, the type of consumer that makes the purchase and the conditions under which they do basically the same point we just made. Yeah. Uh, five, the prior trademark's level of recognition and fame. We could argue that these perfume people hadn't made the word sexual famous, whereas you can pretty exclusively point to the fact that mm -hmm. the reason people know the word holosexual is almost entirely because of you. And we would have used Google Trends in our evidence. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, six, how many similar trademarks are being used? Seven, has actual confusion occurred? This is a really important one. So mm -hmm. are there examples of people buying something of Christine's that says holosexual because they the thought perfume. it was actual like sexual perfume merchandise? Yeah, uh, no. Uh, no, right? Uh, eight, how long has concurrent use occurred and under what conditions? Nine, the variety in goods and services. Ten, the market interface. 11, level of exclusionary rights, 12, the extent of any potential confusion, and 13, other facts that can show there's been an effect due to concurrent use. So anyway, like we, we got to the point of like looking at the case law because I think we were just mostly curious, like mm -hmm. if this did escalate, do we, do we have the case? Would we win a case? And I remember just ultimately it was just we weren't that invested in protecting it in the end. But also it's a question of like, I think people would be shocked to know how expensive it is to actually to pursue these things legally. Like not many YouTubers have actually gone through lawsuits, right? Yeah, it, we've never gone through a lawsuit. This no. is just like normal day-to-day -day fees of paying our IP lawyer to register things. But like if we had actually wanted to pursue this mm -hmm. further, it, would, it was getting close to the point like we would have actually had to make uh, that sort of claim or escalate it into potentially a lawsuit, right? And I don't think we really had any interest in doing that. Mm -hmm. Although, like, we, clearly we do care about protecting your IP. But for any YouTuber who's actually gone through a lawsuit, like, H3H3 is the only one I can think of. And that's because they were sued. It's not even something they initiated. Yeah. And they'll tell you. You go watch those old videos of Ethan and Hila talking about the stress and the financial burden of going through a lawsuit and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars and going through depositions and... Just Depositions. who yeah, wants yeah. to go through that bullshit, frankly, right? So if you can avoid it, man, yeah, don't want to go. One there. thing that's that's frustrating, I think, with this sexual thing too, <laughs> sounds like I hope we don't get demonetized because we keep saying this word. I swear, it's just in the context of trademark, mm -hmm. is that throughout that case um, or the, in discussions with our lawyer, we really realized how ancient and archaic trademark law really is. Because, for example this person or this perfume line was granted that trademark in the 90s, I think. Mm -hmm. And in the 90s, the internet and social media did not exist in the way it does today. Yeah. So they're not like, but trademarks can last, well, not forever, because I guess you have to renew them. Mm -hmm. But the rules around them were established so long ago. And we're arguing something today that, that's about like an online community, direct to consumer, different audiences. And those kinds of things didn't exist at the time when this person registered for this trademark that he still has today. So it was kind mm -hmm. of frustrating for us to, to make these arguments that like the current law and the way they awarded him the trademark didn't contemplate because it didn't exist. It's almost like the law is still stuck in an ancient time where trademarks are just about, is this word on this product in this physical store? Mm -hmm. But that's not like necessarily the only issue today. Sometimes it's, oh, they're using my trademark in their marketing just on the internet. Is yeah. that infringement if it's not stamped on a product in a store? Yeah, the, the online marketplace has definitely introduced some gray area and confusion mm -hmm. about trademark law because you're right. Like if someone 
the, the conventional or traditional understanding of what a trademark is, is it has to appear on the product itself. Mm -hmm. But if someone is selling a bottle of nail polish and the title of the listing was simply nailogical, right. but it wasn't actually printed on the bottle, I think there is some case law now to say that that is essentially them labeling the product because the prominent title of the listing of the web page is that. But that sort of required like case law to sort of clarify what that yeah. means. And you could otherwise make the argument that they're creating confusion in the marketplace and associating mm -hmm. your brand with a the product. There's other ways of going after it. But you're right, like trademark laws weren't written with the internet in mind. Yeah. Case law has had to catch up to sort of understanding how to apply trademark law uh, to the internet age. Anyway, the sexual thing behind us didn't care, but that was sort of our first peek at like what it actually meant to get into some sort to of argue just contentious a <laughs> uh, thing with it. So uh, ultimately you did get the registration, but you had essentially decided you didn't really want to use the term yeah. that much anyway at that point for reasons we've yeah. talked about elsewhere. Uh, the next little... Uh, What's next uh, then? <laughs> Give the, us the tea. The next conflict is probably the one people are most expecting you to talk about because you did sort of publicly talk about it at one point. Yeah. And that's uh, Bath and Body Works mm -hmm. came out with a little bottle of hand sanitizer that said hollow it's me on it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was at the same time that they came out with a series of hand sanitizers and all the other ones had like these little cute internet sayings on them. Like I think one was like slay all day or just like some very yeah. generic internet slang terms. But then the hollow it's me one. Uh, not only did it say hollow, it's me, it had the holographic label, uh, the spacing of the words was even similar to your merchandise that had hollow, it's me on it. And, you know, we wake up one day and you're just getting bombarded with notifications and tweets and texts mm -hmm. of people tagging you saying, Hey, look, I just bought this hand sanitizer. It reminded me of you. Yeah. You're just getting tons of those, right? Our speculation is that some intern probably was like, Googling internet sayings to put on these little bottles of hand sanitizer just for like cute, cheap marketing ideas mm -hmm. and probably didn't realize that that hollow it's me one is like purely associated with you and that we had pending trademark registrations for it at the time. So this is a, I think an interesting case too, because so we, we work with a big law firm here in Canada and that helps because they have a bunch of different people in different departments. So if we have some questions about how U.S. and Canada law works together because we do business in the States, like they have a bunch of lawyers there who are well versed in all these areas of the law. But it's also an issue from the perspective of the other giant companies that operate in Canada are maybe using the same big expensive lawyers we are, right? So when You know we... you're doing good, when. <laughs> so when we went to our usual lawyers and said, hey, uh, we think Bath and Body Works is infringing on our trademark. The first thing they do is they look up if they also represent Bath and Body Works. And it turned out they, they did, did in Canada. Yeah. So we couldn't even discuss this issue with our usual lawyer who mm -hmm. we talk about these things with. And neither could Bath and Body Works. That's true. That works we both, both ways, we right? We both had to get a new lawyer just for the purposes of, of having a conversation yeah, of having, about it. Yeah. So like we're, you're not saying anything at this point because we wanted to at least touch base with a lawyer before you say anything public, mm -hmm. but you're getting all these tweets about it. It made me and so upset. Really frustrating situation. Like we're seeing clips of people buying it because they think you have something to do with it, right? Yeah. And that was yeah. the most frustrating thing. And like I said in my last Simply Neological video, thank you guys for pointing out when mm -hmm. you see things that you think are infringement because I do notice them. I may not respond maybe just because I get a million tweets, but also be strategically, I may not say anything yet, but I collect them. And I got a ton of tweets of people taking a picture in stores at Bath and Body Works of a whole hollow it's me and saying, I just bought this for my friend because she loves you. Yeah. Or I didn't know you had a collab with Bath and Body Works. I'm so proud of you. And like my heart <laughs> breaks a little because yes, I feel taken advantage of, of course. Um, I had nothing to do with it, just to be clear. And B, you guys don't know this yet. You don't know that I denounce this. There is no real relationship and I am being cheated 
is my position. And meanwhile, you think this is like a great thing and you're buying it and you're buying it for your friends and you don't know the, the truth. And if you knew, mm -hmm. you would probably be like, oh, I don't support this. So I felt this very weird, like upset thing that I, I didn't want to say anything because it just because it wasn't smart and we weren't clear on what to do yet. But I was so sad just continuously getting all these comments from you that showed that there was clear confusion in the marketplace because mm -hmm. people actually thought this is so cool. It's like you in a store. Yeah. So we we get in touch with a different lawyer that mm -hmm. we've never worked with before and we talk about the issue and they draft a letter and send that off to Bath and Body Works. And at that point, we're like, we just have to say something about it at this point. You didn't want to just keep letting people buy these things because they think they're yours, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I, so you so I drafted you, something, but we told the lawyers what I would say. <laughs> did, did we exactly? We did. I, anyway, yeah. you, you tweeted out. You just said like, hello, everyone. It's me, Christine, again. A lot of you guys have been commenting on my socials about a product sold at Bath & Body Works with the label Hollow It's Me. Mm -hmm. I want to make it clear that I'm in no way affiliated with or endorsing this product. Uh, Bath & Body Works is infringing on my trademark and misleading my off audience, and I think they're profiting off that confusion. Uh, thank you to everyone who's been tagging me. I didn't want to respond until I talked to my lawyers. They have now contacted Bath & Body Works, and we are waiting for a reply. Thank thanks so much. Appreciate, uh, really appreciate all the support from my Hollow fam. Very professional. <laughs> when meanwhile, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. well, no, and it's not even like a financial yeah. thing. It's not like we're sitting there being like, oh, they're making money off mm -hmm. of us. It's just like it's, it's tricking fans into yeah. buying something because they think it has to do with you. Mm -hmm. And yeah. A anyway, so we send off that letter and that actually, you tweeting this out, it helped, but it also kind of hurt us in a weird way. And I'll yeah. sort of explain why, right? So... A lot of the time, if you're a YouTuber with a big audience and you think a brand is ripping off something that belongs to you, your best course of action might actually just be to call them out on social media. Because what's the likelihood you are actually going to go through a lengthy legal process and actually right. try to resolve it through those that more formal traditional way, right? If you have an influence in an audience, these brands care about their reputation, mm -hmm. you might just be better off publicly shaming them, frankly. Mm -hmm. So I guess you sort of at least achieved what you wanted to in the sense that your fans realized that they that didn't. It, it wasn't to do with They me. weren't going to buy that just because they liked yeah. you because you had nothing to do with it. Uh, but what we saw was the, the comments on Bath & Body Works Social at the time were a lot of confusion. Like, oh, is this, are you working with Christine? Is this Christine's collab or something, but right? But then as soon as I But made, once you posted yeah. that, right, it shifted to people Anger. being kind of angry at them yeah. for... Uh, for using your phrase, your uh, mm -hmm. your catchphrase, which I appreciate. However, it kind of worked against us in a way because in the reply, one of the main arguments they made is, "Hey, look at all these comments. There isn't any confusion. Clearly, they know it's not associated. Clearly, they with know you. you don't have anything but to the, do with like, the product. It's kind of a trap, you see, because yeah. I didn't have a choice. I felt after." I forget how long I waited, a week or two, At least, yeah. before saying, I have nothing to do with this. I had to say that to let my audience know that, mm -hmm. that I it, it wasn't a collab and I'm not okay with this. But then as soon as I said that, yes, people are going to get upset. And their entire Instagram was flooded with people supporting me and saying, how dare you steal from Simply Neological. Mm -hmm. But then they used that against us and said, clearly there's no confusion. There yeah. was confusion <laughs> until I said, don't be confused. Yeah, you see, yeah, like, I know. yeah, <laughs> no, it, it was frustrating, and they their reply was pretty dismissive too. And and frankly, like, I don't want to pretend this is just some super obvious case. Like, it's not like we had registered or had any intention of releasing hand sanitizer well, with Hollow It's Me on it. Legally speaking, let it, let's break this down. We had okay. already filed to register Hollow It's Me in Canada in, and the U.S. at mm -hmm. the time. Trademarks take years to actually register. But you can still claim you own the rights to a trademark if mm -hmm. you just filed it, be, even though it hasn't formally registered yet. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So we were at that stage and it didn't matter. And I see this comment online. Well, it doesn't say registered yet, so it doesn't matter. Well, like that's that's not true. Mm -hmm. Any any IP lawyer will tell you, no, they filed, their intent is to file, intent is mm -hmm. to use it on goods. So they filed and Bath & Body Works 
did not, obviously. Actually, so. sometimes if you if you're the type of person who looks up other people's trademark applications, sometimes you'll see that it says suspended. And it sounds bad. But and a it's lot not. of people assume yeah. that's some awful thing, like, oh, they must have got their trademark rejected. I see that too. When really you mm -hmm. might just be temporarily suspending your trademark application because you're waiting for the registration to be completed in a different jurisdiction that you want to take precedent. Like there's yeah. strategic reasons why you might suspend an application for a period yeah, of time. That doesn't, doesn't mean, mean it's rejection. been rejected. Yeah. So, so legally, we did have the legal rights to it because we'd filed for hollow it's me mm -hmm. they didn't but we would have had to make the argument that you know hand sanitizer is close enough right. to other so, products you care about well let's say this like we hadn't because we how could we have known this would happen and also we didn't really have an intent to sell hand sanitizer <laughs> yeah. at the time that said hollow it's me so hand sanitizer was not included on our initial application mm-hmm which is an argument they used against us, right? Sure, and it, and it is, uh, it's, of course they did, because yeah. that's it's a good argument. I think we had like hand cream on there, because you thought maybe right. maybe I'll sell a hand, a cuticle cream, a hand right. cream at some point, right? But we just right? didn't write hand sanitizer. No. However, no. back to confusion in the marketplace, right. sometimes it doesn't matter, right? If this, the, the objects or the products are so close anyways, like hands, nails, sanitizer, and it's enough confusion in, in the marketplace that it didn't, we were trying to argue that it didn't yeah. matter. And we thought we had like a pleth, and you know, we had way more than we needed of evidence of people being confused and thinking that product was associated with you. Mm -hmm. So ultimately they send back, like we were not surprised by the response, right? Like they're not going to admit fault in a letter back to us. No company why would is. they? Do, why would yeah. their lawyer do that? Yeah. But what they did say uh, strategically, we think, is at the very end of the letter it goes, by the way, this is a seasonal product and will no longer be sold after this date. Right. And in so. our minds, our reading of that, mm -hmm. and I think the pretty clear implication was they were basically saying, we're not admitting we did anything wrong here. Legally. But we're not going to sell it anymore. So you can <laughs> calm down and don't sue us. So don't yeah. sue us. That's kind of how it resolved. Yeah. And that's not a very satisfying feeling at the end of the day because they basically send you a letter back saying you're wrong wrong about this wrong here wrong there but we'll stop but we'll stop yeah. selling it and we're not stopping selling it because you made the argument we're just gonna we're, we're just, just we're saying just gonna we're stop. gonna stop selling it yeah. anyway yeah so yeah it's kind of a dick thing. that's kind of how things <laughs> but it's it's the, the legal strategic approach and like our lawyer explained all the reasons why they would say exactly what they did to us and we understood. And I think mm. ultimately ultimately what happened, although I'm just speculating, is but my guess is whoever was coming up with these designs for hand sanitizer was maybe, you know, an intern or someone and someone else didn't do their their legal due diligence and cross reference all the proposed terms that mm -hmm. they wanted to put on the packaging with legal filings. Because they should have Googled, or not not just Googled, but they should have <laughs> trademarked, cross-referenced everything they wanted to put on their product with an existing catalog of trademarks. The same thing we do for Hollow Taco. So anytime we're writing, um, you know, like shade names on a nail polish, now we're looking for trademark infringement incompat incompatibilities, not necessarily shade names, you know, being the same. Because, sure. for example, Silver Hollow... That, that probably exists somewhere. A nail polish <laughs> company has called that. But they haven't trademarked that as no. a shade name. So it is, you could still use it. I'm just yeah. saying. So shade names, that's a really interesting example because most companies are not <laughs> registering trademarks for like, everything well, yeah, they because, call a shade And so many product. shade names are so generic, like Raven Red or I don't know. You know what I mean? Sure, like yeah. Cherry Red. Or... Yeah, things like that. So, so that's not trademark infringement unless they've filed for a trademark for that shade name. But even a relatively small company like Hollow Taco, mm -hmm. I'm just saying it's small relative to, you know, the Essies and Bath and Body Works of the world. You know, we do a little bit of homework to make sure we're not coming yeah. out with names that have been used by other nail polish companies, basically, or yeah. especially that there aren't existing trademarks for any of the names we've picked. Yeah, I work, I've had to change shade names because yeah. I come up with something, I Google it and I'm like, shit, that sounds Someone's the same as up, someone, yeah. even though legally I still could have used it because they may not have had a trademark for it. Mm -hmm. But legally, sorry, what I was, what I was trying to say was we need to at, at minimum make sure that we're not infringing on someone else's 
uh, trademarks when we come up with shade names. Mm -hmm. Just like Bath and Body Works, a giant global company should have done when they were putting words on their packaging. Someone should have cross-referenced that. They would have seen that Hollow It's Me has a filed trademark by by me. Mm -hmm. And I think someone would have said, okay, don't use that. I think it got past them and then they used it mm -hmm. and then we wrote them a letter and then they're like, oops. Maybe, although they didn't admit. The, no, they I'm, didn't I'm just speculating. Maybe they knew exactly what they were doing but and didn't care. Maybe, but maybe they kind of look at it the same way we look at shade names. Uh, well, I mean, we do more. We at least do the look on shade names, but, uh, you know, there's a certain threshold for, I think, like is a company that big that releases thousands of products a year are they doing a, their due diligence on every, you know, phrase or label they put yes, on a product? they should. They should be, but I guess that doesn't always happen yeah. in practice. And they're just counting on uh, people not caring that much, maybe. I think maybe just in recent years, um, some companies have used slogans or catchphrases that influencers have kind of made their own, thinking that they'll be able to dip into that audience and that the that the YouTuber just doesn't have enough knowledge or business sense, or maybe they even aren't incorporated as a business, mm -hmm. to be able to protect themselves or know exactly what to do. And I think mm -hmm. that there's been a little bit of taking advantage of that. Maybe, but I think there's some nuance here because like, uh, how generic are these phrases? Good you know point. what I mean? If like, if some young influencer comes out with like merch that just says basic bitch on it or something, I, I don't know what a good example is, but it could be something like so generic and not really unique to that person that it wouldn't surprise me if there's just parallel thinking and another company mm -hmm. just wanting to tap in and appeal to an internet yeah. consumer base might use the same thing. I think our argument's always been that we're only really applying for trademarks of terms that are like really very unique to you and that you have given a lot of goodwill and that no one can really make the argument that they were like broader sort of internet terms, right? And I think a good test for that is if you Google the statement or the, the slogan, what comes up? So everything that we filed a trademark for, like I come up predominantly on the first page. Yeah, I, I think, yeah. yeah, we're not going out there applying for crazy. I mean, the one uh, the one example against that that I, I think we want to end on is the word taco. Oh, taco, yeah. Because, <laughs> okay, so when Hollow Taco became... Wait, so are we, have we concluded Bath & Body Works? <laughs> I think we've said what we needed to say this about Bath & Body This was three years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, I just want to, like, I don't have a good feeling about it. It made me sad that all of that happened, that a major company would do that, and that they ultimately didn't want to admit fault. However, I understand legally why they didn't admit fault, but it made me, like, not want to buy their candles anymore. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. That's how I feel, and, um, yeah, that that's where it ended. Yeah, and that's fine. And, I like, I know some people are going to hear this and think we're just sort of, like, entitled YouTubers who think we own words and things like that. And we get that. There's going to be that reaction too. Mm -hmm. But I just ask them to consider that if you had invested a lot and paid a lot of money to protect certain phrases that, you know, you had released products that said those things on them and they really were just uniquely associated with you, it's not a good feeling knowing that other companies are trying to use that and make money off of that. It's not about like the sort of financial loss or us feeling like we missed out on money that could have been made making hand sanitizer. That's mm -hmm. not what the resentment is about at all. Yeah. 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 But, you want to protect your brand. And if you're an influencer, you want to protect your audience. Mm -hmm. And this was, I felt like it had gone out of my control because all of a sudden my audience was buying these hand sanitizers and not knowing that it had nothing to do with me until I s said it had nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. And then everyone was just bashing Bath & Body Works <laughs> on social. Which isn't something like we really wanted yeah. to happen either, right? Anyway, okay, that, that was a bit of a messy situation. So let's end on but something. But it's over now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you sound like you're still angry about it, whatever. No, it's it, not it just that. brought me, I, I mean, I haven't thought about it in years, <laughs> yeah. but it uh, brought me back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can smell the candles in here in my mind. Uh, <laughs> Let's end on maybe a bit more of a positive note. So uh, when Hollow Taco became a reality or when it was close to becoming a reality, we started getting a little more, uh, I think we started spending more money on trademark applications, making sure we were covered in other jurisdictions, mm -hmm. things like that. And uh, we filed a trademark for the word, the, the word taco 
as it only for goods and services related to basically the nail polish cosmetics and stuff right so i think this is a good example again of words that aren't descriptive because some people are just going to think like we're trying to claim the ownership of the word taco right mm -hmm. but i just want to be clear it was it's only because we feel like like obviously we have the holo taco registration but the use of the term taco is sort of so important to the Holo Taco brand. Glossy taco, flaky Holo taco. Yeah, it's a bunch of different product categories. It's used prominently in our branded and marketing and just the brand identity itself. So we just felt it very important to protect, you know, sort of Holo Taco's rights to the term taco being used mostly predominantly for nail polish, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, something really interesting happened when we did that. Uh, we got a letter from uh, Taco Bell when we put in our application. And I think our experience to this point, there had been like a lot of negativity, some uncomfortable situation with a perfume line. We had this issue with Bath and Body Works where we found they were really dismissive of us. So our lawyer says, hey, I just got a letter from Taco Bell. And we're like, oh, like, really? Like, they're worried that we want yeah. it for, for nail polish. But we had a few other things there too, right? Like, like accessory bags for cosmetics and like the application was a little bit broader than nail polish just to be clear but anyway i i think it's okay that i do this but i want to read you this this is the only time i've laughed out loud reading a letter from someone else's lawyer it's kind of amazing and there's no nda here correct no i think we're yeah. <laughs> i think we're okay to say this so we get uh, a letter from taco bell's lawyer in canada and it says uh, as you know, uh, uh, Taco Bell sells a lot of tacos in Canada, and Canadians eat a lot of Taco Bell's tacos. Taco Bell also licenses and actively pursues licensing opportunities for Taco Bell trademarks for various other types of goods such as bags, clothing, footwear, and other consumer goods and personal accessories. Admittedly, these products are not tacos themselves, but they make use of related images and suggest the idea of tacos. As such, these non-taco goods are at least tortilla tangential my <laughs> client is aware of simply nail logicals hollow taco nail polish and ms rotenberg's enjoyable videos providing na nail tutorials via youtube including her recent more expansive work taco bell is also familiar with ms rotenberg's use of the word taco to refer to top coat of nail polish however <laughs> in contrast to a glossy taco simply nail logicals plans for the use of taco on its own and as a trademark are less clear to us not to put too fine a polish on it but Taco Bell's ability to freely operate in various fields of commercial activity using its Taco Bell name and trademark is of crucial importance to it. And we note simply now Logical's trademark application layers its claims for goods and services on quite thick. <laughs> right now, Taco Bell and Simply Nail Logical likely have distinct brand identities, but if both mm -hmm. were to enter the market with overlapping taco formative goods, the distinction between these brands could begin to crack like cheek cheap drugstore acrylics. <laughs> that situation would benefit neither of our clients as it could lead to consumer confusion and undermine the distinctiveness of the party's trademarks. Wow. I'd propose we get ahead of this problem and arrange a phone call to discuss potential terms for coexistence. It is my hope that our clients can adopt a talk cooperative approach to this issue. <laughs> Amazing. The best so legal good. letter I've ever seen in my life. It, it's like cheeky, funny, full of puns. But more importantly than that, it just expressed that they were coming into this with like goodwill, not to have a fight, but just to be like, hey, there's some risk of overlap here. Mm -hmm. Let's have a conversation and just make sure mm -hmm. everything's fine. And so, they also understand, I think they were trying to tell us that we, that they didn't think we were trying to infringe on Taco Bell. Yeah. So they're, they're approaching it that way. Like, we know you guys are d very distinctly different from us. We have different things going on. Mm -hmm. But, like, let's ju we just want to talk. We just want to make sure, sure right? Yeah. And I totally get it because it looks kind of crazy for a nail polish company to be asking to have to rights taco. to the words taco, yeah. right? So ultimately, uh, I, uh, there's no NDA here, but I, out of respect, I don't want to, like, get too clear, uh, transparent about it. But essentially, we just came to an agreement with them that, like, yeah, we'll... we'll we come to an agreement that our our brand identities are so distinctively different mm -hmm. that we're not going to tr try to stop each other from doing things. Right. So not only did they not block our application, but we came to an agreement with them that if Taco Bell is applying for trademarks on on accessories or other things that could come close to the kinds of things we care about, we've agreed with them that we will help them in the sense that we'll say 
we're not opposed to Taco Bell trying to Hmm. secure trademarks for things that even come close to nail and polish because we think taco if taco bell came out with a nail polish tomorrow i'd probably be like can you send it to me i'll <laughs> review it on my channel no charge <laughs> i don't think they are gonna come out yeah, with a I nail know. polish but uh... <laughs> dunkin donuts did you just never know <laughs> <laughs> anyway just after all this sort of like more negative experiences of getting into mm -hmm. arguments and disagreements with brands it was so refreshing like we don't eat a lot of fast food you i guess know but why, this makes me want to eat taco bell yeah we don't there's not much of it in canada or is there just not where we are there, there are there but are. they're less it's just common. not as common yet yeah. you know what this makes me think though taco bell especially in recent years and i've seen them work with like digital media stars they have a much better understanding of how important it is to you know stay cool with the online influencers <laughs> because it's in their interest and the interest of their business to be like we're cool we're hip and I think that's also been their approach in their legal filings, at least in our experience, which I think is incredibly smart and just current of them, unlike our other experiences with more archaic brands, let's say. <laughs> so I thought that was so cool of them. Yeah, you know, like, uh, yeah, I have nothing but good things to say about Taco Bell and their lawyer. I remember talking to our lawyer and be like, hey, so like, should I pay you our hourly rate to come up with a bunch with of puns? taco puns in, <laughs> in response? The response? <laughs> Ultimately, they just had a conversation about it, but... Uh, yeah. Anyway, just thank you to Taco Bell. How about that? Mm -hmm. So if we can loop back around to the beginning of the conversation, let's Christine. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about... Uh, is it worth it? Is it worth it to YouTubers to make a bunch of registrations or apply for a bunch of different trademarks? Not just to YouTubers, but I imagine um, when I saw some questions in the comments of my last Simply video, it was smaller content creators, maybe they're artists, maybe they're musicians, or maybe they're just coming up with cool designs on t-shirts. So I think... I mean, that's a tougher question, it is, right? It is tougher because I think the majority of our listeners um, aren't, you know, YouTubers with 7 million subscribers. Yeah. And we were in a different position um, even four years ago to be able to afford a lawyer on which we spent almost $200,000 to date. <laughs> well, like, on let, let's stuff be, related. Yeah. Let's be clear. Like leading up to Holo Taco... Mm -hmm. The money we were spending securing trademarks and stuff uh, really added up because we were starting a brand. Protecting the brand identity is just an incredibly important thing, right? Right. So it's one thing to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on trademark applications and on an IP lawyer if you are coming up with a product line or launching a brand that you expect you to make a lot of money and you're going to make a that money back. ROI, Ben. ROI. <laughs> But like if you're just a, you, and, and maybe that's, that's like a fundamental question, I guess, right? If you're a YouTuber, do you need to apply for a bunch of trademarks? Like the first question you should ask yourself, like, are you really even going to release a bunch of merch that uses that mm -hmm. thing? Are there a few slogans or logos or sayings that are just so specifically you that you feel you need to protect in that way? Because it will help you go after people selling counterfeit merch of yours if you could point to a trademark registration mm -hmm. and to just have like one trademark registered maybe only in the u.s if that's all you really care about isn't that expensive or crazy to but do but even if you have registered or sorry you filed for trademarks let's mm -hmm. say in the u.s and and canada doesn't mean that other companies won't use that trademark and sell it all it means is that you have some arsenal in your backpack to point to, to get angry at, but you've got to spend more money on your lawyers to have them mm -hmm. get angry and use things that you already spent a money on, spent well, a lot of money if on. If it escalates to a dispute, right. but if you're just trying to get Amazon or some merch company to take it down, they might just have a, a platform themselves for which you, you can make that complaint and sure. you don't have to hire a lawyer at all. Right, sometimes. I yeah. would say though for... For YouTube, for anyone with an online presence or an online business, you know, like we're kind of anti, like you've never had a manager or an agent. And we've heard about people who lose a lot of their income mm -hmm. to those people. If, if you're going to have anyone in your corner who kind of has your back, I think have a good lawyer or lawyers who mm. know like IP or entertainment law or, you know, just even a good accountant, I think, is more important than having, like, agents manager, or managers yeah. and things like that. That is really good advice, actually. Yeah. And that's something we 
did early on without anyone telling us this is advice for you. I just kind of thought it was the smart thing to do was to incorporate the business, which I did in 2015. I remember it cost like 50 bucks or something to incorporate. <laughs> we didn't really know what we were or doing. Or maybe it was 250. Um, didn't know what I was doing. I incorporated it myself without advice from anyone. And in retrospect, we had to change things because there was other things you, you wanted it to be structured as. Uh, but we got an accountant and a lawyer very early on before I was like, you know, as big at the height of Simply Neological. And I think that helped us a lot be proactive in a lot of financial and litigious decisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Hello, it's me. <laughs> Actually, I did want to add. So there are way more companies than just the ones we've discussed who've used my trademarks. And mm -hmm. over the years, I've seen you guys show me um, like screenshots. And I'm not going to use any more names of companies because I honestly don't want to give them business and I think they were a smaller deal than Bath and Body Works which was just like so obvious and out there for so long but there was at least four other companies over the last few years who put hollow it's me on either a nail product nail polish mm -hmm. or like a cosmetics bag and sold a physical version of that in stores mm -hmm. i particularly remember this happening somewhere in in europe and someone took a picture of like a bunch of nail polish with this giant sign that said hollow it's me in big block letters with silver hollow and people are like look christine you're in germany or europe yeah. or wherever it was and it was in a bunch of stores and that was another time where okay lawyer here's these pictures we found this can you please contact them um and I think ultimately these, the four brands I'm thinking of that we had to do this with, they, they all stopped selling or at least they took off the listings online and you couldn't find it on their social media anymore after we had our lawyers reach out to their lawyers. Yeah. And I don't think that was necessarily from bad press, like from me telling people like, hey, go shit on this company, which I didn't do. Like I actually didn't say anything, if I recall. At least maybe for one of them, I said that's that's not mine because it was getting to the point where too many people were asking me if it was. Uh, but it happens a lot and more than I've talked about and more than, you know, you might come across. Bath and Body Works was the most egregious case just because everyone knows what that is and it was in like mm -hmm. 200 stores or something. Uh, but there's been so many other companies who've taken my legal trademark and I think what people have to understand is like some, it might sound a little petty to be like so concerned about some obscure company on the other side of the world who maybe isn't even that big selling things. But mm -hmm. you have to be careful in that if, if you are claiming a trademark, you have to protect it. You have to show yeah. evidence that you're protecting it, right? Good point. So ben. like once in a while, we'll get an email from just like a fan or someone who like likes drawing pictures of you. And they might ask, like, am I allowed to sell this? And maybe it's a drawing of you and it says... Like oh, simply analogical or, it says something, or like, something, yeah. So we're like, we're not even going to reply to that. But I think, I, I hope people just understand, like, we can't be giving people permission to make money off of selling things with your branding on it. Mm -hmm. Because that would undermine our ability to protect big companies and predatory companies from also just doing the exact same thing. We have to show evidence that we are sort of claiming that these yeah. things are our intellectual property yeah. and other people can't use or sell yeah. them. Yeah, and you have to be proactive in protecting your trademark. So although maybe it sounds like, why do you bother, Christine, sending lawyers letters you know, to EU when people have used your, your slogans? If I notice that there's companies using our trademarks, we have to protect those trademarks. That's part of the whole process. That's part of the responsibility of having trademarks. And so it's kind of like, well, I have to do my due diligence here. I got to tell my lawyer and he's got to, you know, send that letter. It's mm -hmm. just part of the, the process and the responsibility of having it. Mm -hmm. But if we could rewind back to 2016, 2017, I'm probably less uh, angry and aggressive about some of the cases you that we've talked about then? even today. It really stressed you out, some <laughs> of these. It used to really stress me out. But, me too. Uh, I think the only reason I'm happy we went through the the lengths we did and the expense we did is because Holo Taco became a thing. Mm -hmm. And it very much matters for that. 
But if you were just a person making internet videos, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it was really worth going through all that expense if that's all it was for at the same mm -hmm. time. So, yeah, and I think the advice really depends on are you going to grow a brand with things you're going to sell? Are you going to get a return on that investment? Is that the plan? Or is it just more of a artistic creative passion project, in which case maybe the expense of trademarking isn't worth it for you? Yeah. And I mean, that's a whole other conversation, right? Like the way the legal system isn't really built to be accessible to for, people for that digital. don't have a lot of money. And also just for, for digital use. Like it doesn't No, I really... think the, the courtrooms understand digital art and stuff now to some degree, but I, I think it's just more the barrier to most people is yeah. like, am I spending thousands of dollars to claim mm -hmm. my ownership of a picture just so some asshole company doesn't steal it? They're probably not going to go through that. I'd say like the cheapest advice that we could give you is watermark your stuff. No, I, I think that's yeah, a great one. Yeah. I've always been crazy on watermarking. <laughs> like I watermarked like videos of just me talking on my own channel. I know, ben yeah. hated that. So I finally took well, it, it off. It just seems <laughs> so strange to me. Like like you are a well-known YouTuber who would always Still watermarking. write. Still watermarking. Because I was used to for years it being my nails and companies yeah, and as we've gone over stolen. would use. They would still cut out my watermark, but at least it would help protect me mm -hmm. to some extent. And I think if you're an artist and you create content, that's cheap and easy and you can easily do that. And then the next route is if someone takes your your art or your content is um, to try and file for a claim process. Maybe if it's something that's listed on Amazon, on Facebook, Instagram, all of those have intellectual property um, claims processes that you can enter your reasoning, enter whatever evidence you have and like the source art fits on your, maybe it's your deviant art page or whatever, wherever you post your art. You, there are some tools available to you, uh, but it's pretty much at the mercy of the decision of the platform on which this, you know, infringement is being hosted. Well, uh, apologies to Dixie D'Amelio. We were going to have her over for dinner, but we ran out of food. We ran out of snails. <laughs> I'm sorry, that should have been coming from you, not from me. <laughs> uh, congratulations okay there, on a million man? followers on uh, TikTok. Uh, I think it was like 10 it, million. No, oh, it was 100 million. million. <laughs> ben, ben, we're so out of the loop. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I hope that was somewhat interesting. I know there's a risk in having converse. I think the yeah. reason people don't talk about this is because it's really easy to come off as sort of entitled, as if like you own words and other well, companies aren't allowed to use words, right? Well, yeah, it's not entitled if you actually do own like a legal <laughs> trademark. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like LeBron James, I remember, uh, tried to trademark Taco Tuesday a oh, while yeah. back for something. And the internet just like relentlessly mocked the guy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think there is a risk that people might have a similar reaction to some of the things we said here, right? Like even the hollow it's me thing, that is the most common thing. From our perspective in our bubble, it was so clearly associated with your brand and something you made famous. But I wonder if other people have a different perspective on it. Oh, yeah. I saw a lot of um, mostly like nail polish companies that didn't like me, uh, didn't like it. <laughs> They thought I shouldn't have the rights to it. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, at least we didn't try to argue we own the word hollow. How about no, that? and, and I've, <laughs> exactly. We don't. We, we, we don't. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Well, thank you for joining us on Taco Tuesday, not trademarked. <laughs> That's you right. can use it if you want. <laughs> We'll see you next Taco Tuesday, yeah. not registered trademark. Nope. <laughs> Thanks so much for, for watching. watching. And we'll see y'all later. <laughs> Bye. Bye.